Creative Insurgents. Creative Insurgents. Hey everybody, this is Corey Huff with The Abundant Artist. And Melissa Dinwiddie with Living a Creative Life. And hi, I'm Minnie. And this is the Creative Insurgents Podcast. Where we are all about living a creative life according to your own rules. Mm-hmm. Yay! 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 <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, it's been crazy over here. I don't know about you, but life is just uh, a big old bowl of crazy right now. Yeah, me uh, too, Corey. Getting, getting ready to... <laughs> uh, crazy tastes wonderful. Um, when I I'm getting ready to go into rehearsals, and so I'm making sure that we have all of our uh, you know all the chairs for our space because we're doing our show in this art gallery, and uh, logistics are not my strength, so it's been fun. Uh, but I'm having a good time, and I'm glad I get to do what I'm doing. What about you? Ah, that's awesome. Well, I'm in the middle of my Get Sparked to 30-day course, and that's just going so well. I had a wonderful live call with everybody on that in that course yesterday. And like you, I am in the middle also of a big production. My academy program, your Big Bold Creative Life Academy, starts on Monday, so I'm in the middle of launch craziness, and mm-hmm. that's uh, that's always a lot of fun. So I'm um, it's keeping me off the streets. Nice. And Minnie, what are you doing? Oh, I'm studying frogs. Studying yeah. frogs. <laughs> awesome. I, I learned you... what the word synthanthropy means. Synthanthropy. 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 You guys can't say it. <laughs> <laughs> what does that word mean? It means when a when a species um gets along with people like human environments and can adapt like squirrels. Oh, like uh, like kitties? Like kitties and squirrels <laughs> and foxes and things, yeah. Nice. Okay, I learned synthanthropy. Synthanthropy. Yeah. Synthanthropy. I think I need to see the... Uh, I need to see the, the, the word, too. <laughs> I need to see the word. I need, I need the phonetic alphabet. Um, Frogs and newts and toads. Wow, that's cool. Uh, we'll have to, we'll have to uh, see those when they're done. Um, so, I, Melissa, Minnie, I'm, you both know that I'm very, very excited about today's guest, Stephen Goldsmith. Um, Stephen gave a talk at the Utah mm-hmm. Arts Council meeting in the summer of 2007 that was very meaningful for me, uh, both on a professional and a personal level. Uh, the talk was called Breaking Down the Silos of Creativity, and... It was the first time that I had ever seen uh, somebody who I saw as a professional artist talk about talk about that it's okay to have interest in things other than simply making art, Hmm. right? Like you you can you can have an effect in the world around you through your art and through the skills that you develop as you become a more skilled artist. So. Um, I'm very glad to have him here today. And, and Stephen Goldsmith, just to let you, those of you who don't know him, know a little bit about him. He's a sculptor, um, and his large-scale environmental works and water features can be found all throughout Salt Lake City and other places. Uh, Stephen's the founder of Art Space, a nonprofit that develop that develops live work and live work housing and space uh, places. I don't know how to say the right word, space places, and office space for nonprofit agencies. Um, He's got a long history of public art projects and awards. Uh, if you go to his website, you can see uh, just tons and tons of awards. Um, and he lectures at the University of Utah's architecture school. Go Utes! I'm a, I'm a Ute. <laughs> and, uh, and he's really done a lot more than I can possibly outline here. And one of the cool things is uh, Stephen was actually the planning director for Salt Lake City leading up to the 2002 Winter Olympics. But he prefers to be called a homemaker. Stephen, thank you very much for being here. It's my pleasure. I am so happy to be here with you and love the work that you, Melissa, and Minnie are doing. This is the kind of creative work that, um, you know, we can all break out and just do. We don't have to be labeled with a particular kind of uh, creativity. It's about the creative spirit and creative energy, and you guys all have that. Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm really glad we get to do what we do. Me too. So, Stephen, let's dive right... <laughs> Stephen, let's dive right in. I, um, why do you think it's so important for artists to do more than just make their art? Well, I, you know, the, the idea that it's more important that they just make their art, I leave that to each individual creator 
to determine the importance of their work. But here's what I've observed. I've observed that, you know, in our culture, we have been very good at segregating people. So artists are painters or sculptors or musicians or actors, whatever it may be. And it's, it's really unfortunate because our impulse is creativity. The tools, the materials change, but the creative impulse stays the same. And when we are forced to define our work as being within a rectangle, if we're a painter or a photographer, or being in a gallery, or being on a stage in a formal theater, I think it takes away that sort of evolutionary impulse that we all have as creators. So to say that it's more or less important, I wouldn't say but. I would say that it's vital that we tap into our roles as artists, as healers, as transformers, as change agents. And sometimes I'm afraid that artists don't feel the permission to go outside of their chosen discipline. You know, you've got to be a painter. That's what you do. You're a painter. And I just don't agree with that. I, I think that those are archaic. I think that some people just want to paint and they should just go paint. But when a painter is given the permission to engage with his or her community, in ways that can be transformative. It brings out new forms of creativity. Uh, think of an artist like Candy Chang. Think of the work that Candy Chang has been doing as a artist slash planner. Her work has been transformative throughout the world. And if she had been told to just keep to her role as a graphic artist or just as a planner, I don't think she would have found the freedom to create the kind of iconic work that she's creating today. Boy, I could not agree with you more, Stephen. I I call myself a passion pluralite because I I've never been happy staying in any particular any particular box, and and so I the the, the only way that I could kind of um, you, we still have to tell people what you do, right? When you meet somebody at a party or something, and they ask you right. what you do, and you want to share what you, what your creative expressions are. You still want to be able to do that in a in a short way. So I think human beings, we have this desperate desire to be able to label ourselves, and yet it it does get us in so much trouble because it, I for a long time thought of myself as well. I'm just a ketuba artist and a jazz singer. Yeah. But those two labels, you know, is bigger than just I'm I'm a visual artist or whatever. But those two labels in and of themselves were not enough for me. So I created this bigger label, Passion Pluralite, which gives me the permission to do all kinds of different things and that way also I get to consider my teaching as part of my art form as well which it is for me it's a huge creative outlet for me but I think a lot of artists or you know people who have a particular label like you said they often don't allow themselves to to spread out more yeah well Melissa you may be my long lost sister in all of this because <laughs> I, because I do think that that's the spirit of the work you know, if you say you're a ketuba artist, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you think about um, tikkun olam within that tradition of healing and repairing the world and our work is not, we may not be able to finish the work, but it's to continue the work. We have to use every tool that we have as creators. And unfortunately, that cultural construct that we have, which is, if you go to a party, as you began to describe, and somebody says, what do you do? In some cultures, that would be so offensive. Mm -hmm. It would be offensive that somehow my work is going to define who I am. So somebody you go to a party and somebody says, what do you do? You say, I love. I'm compassionate. That's what I do. I, I spend my days as an empathic, essential animal. That's my work. I'm an empathic, essential animal. And that should be sufficient to get the conversation going, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. I So when I go to parties... Um, I hang out, a lot of my best friends are very businessy, you know, technology startup, entrepreneur-y people, and I go to parties with them, and I think they kind of invite me because I'm the weirdo, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I, I have, like, stupid party tricks, like, when I meet people, I, I ask people, so what's your story? And there every time go. I go to one of these parties, I, I, and I ask someone that, they, they pause, and they think, and they just tell me their life story. <laughs> and and because they don't because they've never thought about it and um and I love that I love that that's a wonderful to, I'm gonna try that yeah I love to ask people what what are you passionate about mm -hmm. and Which some people get really turned off by that 
Some yeah. people get really turned off by it. Like, like, but what's your story or what's your passion? You you meet some people and they just they're expecting you to ask them what their profession is and what. Yeah. They do, but they don't want to go there, and that's fine. But that's fine. some people get really turned off by that. And those become defining moments, I think, sometimes in our relationships, where if you don't want to do that dance with me, that's fine. There's another partner across the way. I'll see if she wants to. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So, um, from a practical standpoint, like there is a certain need to say, you know, I make paintings, and here's my painting, and here's how much it costs, and all of that kind of stuff. And and so, there. How do you zoom out from that practical place and and branch out into other things? Like Stephen, you you've gone into land development and city planning and other other efforts. How do you? What is, what is that like for you? Well, I, I actually refer to myself as the accidental professor, the accidental developer, the accidental planning director. They're all accidents because of, I have given myself that uh, sort of living a creative life way of being that allows me to attach to those opportunities that matter to feed my spirit and to have me participate in that uh, and as I mentioned before, to heal and repair the earth. It's, you know, all of us are doing that stuff, right? We mm -hmm. do it as individuals, we do it as uh, sculptors, as builders, as carpenters, whatever it may be. But to identify that way, almost as though, I mean, here's another way that I, I sort of take the medical model. Imagine that we're all very healthy viruses out here, and that, or antibodies. And we find those places in our daily lives that um, we want to affect in a positive way. We want to uh, maybe reverse something that's negative. We may want to feed something that's positive. But either way, we are sort of almost out there floating as though we are antibodies or a healthy virus and not being forced to just do what somebody tells us to do or what our instincts tell us to do. That's the way we're adaptive. That's the way I think we're responsive. And by exhibiting that kind of empathy, if you will, this is empathy towards all forms of life, whether it's an environmental problem that we're working on, uh, whether it's a uh, historic preservation project that we're working on. What we're seeing are, we're, we're approaching ideas that matter, really as artists, as creators. Now what do I do to take this new material that I have and use it to, and, and transform it with whatever tools I have? If I don't have those tools, I may go rent them, like hire somebody, you know, rent, rent a person that knows that tool. I may actually actually physically go out and buy a tool. I may learn how to do a uh, podcast. I may learn whatever it may be. I know that it's just a creative process and keeping the tools that I have sharp and then adding new tools all the time gives me a flexibility as a creator that allows me to be a planning director. You know, an unlikely thing for an artist to become a planning director in a major city is getting ready for the Olympics. But there's a certain it's not a confidence necessarily because I think so many of us in our creative lives do have an insecurity with us. But it's because we see that it's work that matters. It's not about us anymore. It's about the work. And that way we can apply ourselves with all of the force of our passion, all of the force of our commitment, um, and always gaining knowledge and finding others who want to do that with us. Oh, Stephen? Hi, Minnie. Question. Hi. I have a question. So, what you mean is with the virus metaphor is to be proactive and go solve the problem. Precisely. Like, identify the problem and go in instead of waiting. Instead of waiting, instead of running away, um, uh, just being that present. So much of this is about being present. And it can change from day to day. Um, what is important today may not be as important tomorrow. Um, yeah. And it's that, that, that's part of being adaptive, I think. Do you, do you agree? Oh yeah, I do. And I was thinking about what you said earlier about um, how, like, I wanted to say that kids don't have resumes. You know, like when you're a kid, you totally you do everything, and no one says, "Oh, you're a what are you? <laughs> like, what do you do?" And you're all, "No, I I'm a kid." I do everything. <laughs> exactly. So this is in a way like being childlike and never growing up because you don't have to be like a label. You could just be be new and stuff. 
Yeah, yeah. that's a good. It's a good song. I won't grow up. I won't grow up. I don't want to go to school. You know that song. <laughs> <laughs> Kids don't have silos of creativity. Beautiful. Beautiful. That's right. Um, Stephen, you talked about just trying things and solving problems and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, the thing that really blew my mind when I saw you talk a few years ago was how you got started with that building in downtown Salt Lake that you and some other sculptor, and, and you know, it's been a, a few years, so I may have made up some of the details, but uh, that, that you and some other sculptors got started renovating this building and and the renovation of that building was really successful, so you sort of turned that into additional projects like that. Can you just talk a little bit about what that was and how you got started with, with that project? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, sure, sure. And, and it's wonderful to sit here. All these years have gone by, and somehow that story mattered to you. Uh, that, that's a, a beautiful thing, and, and I thank you for bringing it up. When I was about 23 years old, and didn't have a studio space with heat or running water. Uh, that's a great motivator. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I um, decided that in the 20th century that I didn't need to live that 19th century kind of a life. Um, even though I was very productive in that studio, I have to say, um, there's some benefits of being in that kind of an environment. But I just, it was very, very hard because I had a number of part-time jobs to keep myself fed, plus my profession, right? The profession wasn't feeding me. Part-time jobs fed me, but the profession wasn't. I decided if I had more efficient space, didn't have to spend so much time getting it heated up, could go down at 2 in the morning and not have to spend 90 minutes getting it up to 50 degrees, that that would help my life. So I was very motivated. Um, I didn't know what I was doing. I had no idea what that creative process was going to lead to. But through a process of uh, pushing, um, adding and removing, you know, that's what we do as, as sculptors with clay, it's additive and subtractive, right? So add something, take something away. Decided to add more opportunities, for example, we found a small building near a park here in our city, a very underutilized part of our neighborhood, the highest crime part of our neighborhood the highest poverty, the highest crime in our city, the highest poverty in our city. And so there were industrial there were industrial buildings there that were underutilized. We found a small building that seemed to work. And when I went to the city to say, I found this building, is there a way that we might turn this into housing for, for artists and workspace for artists? They didn't really quite know what to make of it. So we had to subtract that building from the idea and then go to a building that was even more battered and you know, it was a building that the city wanted to tear down, frankly. If I show you photos, you'd say, that's a, what, how did you ever come up with that building? But the city had a motivation, I had heard, of creating affordable housing in the city. So I began to think of ways to align our interests in this high crime, high poverty area of the city. It's a, it's a long story to tell, but there were some pivot points, some, some aha moments that happened along the way that really informed the way that the building developed. It was an 81,000 square foot building. It was partially used. It had a 20, 27,000 square foot open space behind it, which had been a railroad spur where nothing grew anymore. It had... Uh, barely any sagebrush back there. We couldn't even get flies back there. There wasn't a bird. There wasn't a bird to be found in the area. So that was an area that we knew we'd have to tackle. But when I went to the city and said, you know, we're the poor artists of the city. We really need your help. They said, well, there are a lot of poor people in our city who need help, Mr. Goldsmith. That really stopped me in my tracks, and I realized the absurdity of what I'd said. I was quite embarrassed, to be honest. And I wasn't going to go and try to fight for money um, with people from the Rape Crisis Center or people from the homeless shelter or people from the food bank. Obviously, they needed it more than we did. And I was quite discouraged at that point because I just didn't know if I had the wherewithal to continue pushing because this is a large project. We, Myself and the two other people I was doing with this with, we only had $50 between us. <laughs> and we knew that to set up a nonprofit and get this going was going to be very difficult. So I, I had a conversation with, a, with an old man who was in the neighborhood where I had been living as a young man, and told him the problem. He was a very good listener. 
and he said, I understand your problem. What, what if I give you the money to go to this conference that you've told me about? There was a conference the NEA put on about spaces and places for the arts, and I didn't have the money to go, and he said, I'll give you the money and the plane ticket in the hotel, and you can go and learn what you can about places and spaces for the arts. So I went to Pittsburgh with all kinds of people in the performing arts and uh, not so many in the visual arts but, but, but a lot of people concerned about creating, establishing creative places for creativity. And on that, uh, uh, on that journey I met another old man who was an actor and I was describing it to him what I had been trying to do. I said, you know, I went to the city and we said that with, along with myself and other poor artists in the city and he stopped me right there and he said, you told them that you were the poor artist of the city and you need their help? I said, that's what I told them. He said, go back to the city where you came from and tell them that you are the artist of the city and you have a lot to offer. That was a paradigm shift. That was a way of getting our dignity back and going back to the city and saying, we're the artists of the city, we have a lot to offer you. Our shoulders went back. They said, oh, like, what do you have to offer? Well, we know you have a desire to create new housing in the underutilized part of the town. and We can do that for you. Not only can we do that for you and with you, but we can create creative spaces for all kinds of people who will add value in terms of the culture. Maybe it will become a destination for tourists. Maybe it will become a way with 24 hours of light on that neighborhood will become a safer place, something which Jane Jacobs described as eyes on the street. We will be doing all of these things for you, helping you meet your goals. At the same time, we will have a place that meets our needs as well. That change, we have something to offer. I think at that moment it reshaped my idea as artist. It reshaped my artist as my, my, my sense of self as creator. And then it was the idea of artists as city builders. Artists as city builders. The, the city became a canvas. The city became a lump of clay. The city became a place where my commitment to social justice could be a part of my creative life. My, my sense of environmental justice became a part of my creative life. And through all of that, because I had a place that I could afford to live, the economic justice began to return to my own pocketbook. Hmm. Those moments of taking this building built in 1910, transforming it into a creative place for artists and others, including the incubation of other nonprofits who were trying to do this kind of work, was that transformative moment that opened the door for me to say such things as, you know, the, only the tools and materials change, the, the creative process stays the same. Wow. Yeah, I'm not quite speechless. sure what to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, Stephen, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, you know, you can, I hope that those of you that are listening can feel the power in the way, in, in that paradigm shift that Stephen talked about. You know, I grew up, uh, so, you know, if you've listened, read my stuff for a while, you know that I grew up very poor. And college and immediately post-college was a time when I met people like Stephen and some other successful entrepreneurs who really changed the way that I thought about art and the way I thought about what I wanted to do with my life. And I think that Culturally, as artists, we spend a lot of time talking about getting grant money and getting donations and setting up non not for profits, and those are all you know they're well and good, and the resources are there, and, and we should take advantage of them. But I think thinking about how can we add value mm -hmm. uh, is more powerful than that. I, I don't know. I don't know how to express that. Well, maybe, maybe I can just build upon what you're thinking and maybe feeling right now mm -hmm. because, you know, Corey, we're part of a movement. We're part of a movement that isn't really named yet. It's part of a movement that is just emerging and we're all grappling with who are we as creators in this culture. Listen, we all know that this is a culture, this is a planet that needs creative help. One of the things that I do when I talk to my students is repeat the phrase that one of the crises of our time is actually a crisis of the imagination. How do we begin to imagine our way out of the problems which we see, whether it's on the news or in a magazine, 
or in the work of another documentary artist or a documentary storyteller and we hear those stories and they move us and they move us deeply but then now what do we do next? So I think by freeing us up as creators with that simple simple idea that we're just creators who knows what kind of imagination we might find which leads to innovation and, and you know, as you know as a creator and I think as Melissa knows as a creator so often in the process of creating we have things that might be labeled failures right oh that you know whatever it may be but each one of those failures is a building block I don't believe that failure is a valid concept you talk to anybody in a laboratory here at the University of Utah um, and they'll tell you that every one of the failures we have is a successful laboratory experiment mm -hmm. it's a successful experiment so we can't do it any worse right as creators it's not like we're about to release some kind of uh, uh, toxic poison in the air with the work we do I mean there are people who might think that the work you know the, the ideas are kind of toxic but you know, they, they, they're just ideas they can't really hurt anybody if we take this idea of creative process not creative product but creative process and apply it to the problems of our time the world needs the most creative people it can find right now it's not going to happen with the same old way of doing things because it's the same old way of doing things that has gotten us into these problems in the first place. I think Minnie's going to ask ask a question that I've been wanting to ask. Go ahead, oh. Minnie. Oh, probably not. But anyway, um, so Mr. Goldsmith, I was thinking about cities and what you said about how you changed your city, and what I like to think of is cities need artists because if you try to imagine a city without the arts then suddenly it becomes really obvious to me that um, a lot of times when a city is going to turn around the arts come first and the arts move in first and then you have a you know thriving downtown and cultural environment that has to happen first yeah I, I think I think that's true I, I see it all the time and another thing many that I, I would imagine you've thought about this before, is that when we define the arts broadly, then we begin to bring other creators into the process with us that creates a different kind of community. I'll give you a couple of examples. Think of be people in the culinary arts. Those people who are taking a uh, vegetable mm -hmm. and taking that vegetable and cutting it just so beautifully and sautéing it in just the right seasons, those colors, those, those flavors, the way that the, the flavors begin to affect your nose and it looks beautiful, and the, the way that that conversation can actually, the way that food can lead to a conversation, right? Mm -hmm. Yummy. So defining the arts broadly invites other people to join us in this creative process and bring out in them ways of creating that they may not have seen before even a seamstress, uh, a tailor, uh, uh, these people who sometimes are seen as craftspeople, uh, they're creators and if we invite them to join us in this creative process many in the way that we build cities around creativity imagine how much more we can expand that so it's not about just the artist making the painting which are great or the sculpture which is great or the pot which is great but every part of our lives where beauty is no longer an option but beauty is the way we live our lives I, love I like that. that. Thank you. Where beauty is no longer an option. Mm -hmm. Where beauty is the way we live our lives. Love that. Mm -hmm. yeah. We try, don't we? We all try. Sometimes we do it better. Some days are more difficult. But if that's the way we get up in the morning, this will be a day of creating. Whether it's in our kitchen, whether it's in our studio, whether it's just being with the three of you. I mean, for me, this is a creative process. I've got three people I really don't know um, <laughs> having a conversation. So let's create. Yeah. So Stephen, um, one thing that I have n have encountered in a lot of my work with artists is they are interested in exploring some of the ideas that you're talking about, about getting out of their own comfort zone, uh, trying to explore some of the, you know, maybe becoming a land developer or starting some crazy business that they thought of but have no idea how to go do it how do you break down the the mental barriers that prevent you from trying things outside of your discipline any thoughts there you know I think it gets down to commitment 
think it gets down to the way that we commit to whatever work we want to do in a day. I give you, can I give you an example that I've recently discovered? Um, my niece is uh, living in Chicago right now, and she's an actress. And not satisfied with being just a performer on the stage, but wanting to work with others whose commitment to community is a big part of their day. They put together a nonprofit, and it's named FYI. And what it does is it uses theater as a way to help youth understand their lives as sexual beings. What I mean by that is that people who may have suffered from sexual abuse may not have the ability to address or speak about these projects. The theater is a way for them to be able to talk openly about their experience. They go out and they work with other youth. They will do um, play acting as a way to understand their experience and feelings. And this is now a very successful uh, small company of people who are, you know, 30-somethings and below. So what informed that was their experience as participants, again, in healing and transforming a segment of the population that they wanted to help but didn't know how to do it. So now their creative process is the lens through which they do this work. So I, I think, Corey, the question gets down to commitment. It also gets down to the way we psychologically attach to something. Um, you know, it may be that as creators we want to use, if we're actors, uh, 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 protest against environmental degradation or protest against war or protest against something. As actors, we can do that. Um, you know, each of us, if we allow that attachment, something that really we care about, that informs it. And this, our ego goes away. In fact, there's a lot of research going on right now about the way the frontal cortex of our brain subsides, that, that place that produces all that anxiety and, I guess, the ego. I don't know much about it, but um, there, there's research saying when we engage in things that matter, sort of like flow, in the, in, when we talk about our work you, you, as artists, as creators, you get into flow, when we let go of all of that uh, superego and all that judgment, we just find a way to do it. It's letting go of these cultural constructs. It's letting go of what our parents say. It's letting go of what a teacher says. It gives us the freedom to just go out and do it. And that's the spirit of the work that we do in our studio or do in our stage or we do in our sound studio that we can actually take out and do in other ways. It's very liberating. You know, that this also speaks to something that, that I bring into my programs a lot. This, a lot of the things that you're talking about are things that a listener might think, well, I don't know how to do that. You know, that can't possibly, they might have a desire to make a change in the world in some way, but they might think, but I don't know how to do that, I'm not ready. I just actually wrote a blog post about this very thing. <laughs> and, and the key is that when it, you know, a calling, you're never ready. You never right. really feel ready. To, that's one of the hallmarks of a calling, <laughs> is that you don't feel ready. You, you know, I mean, think of, think of Moses getting called by God, right? <laughs> what did he do? He ran away. <laughs> he didn't feel, he was, he was a stutterer. He didn't feel prepared, right? That is one of the hallmarks of a calling, and it's, it's, go, it's stepping on the path towards that calling, having no idea where that path, how to, what you're going to do. Being on that path and moving toward it is going to teach you what you need and give you what you need in order to make that calling happen. And I'm sure that your niece and her friends, they didn't know how they were going, you know, they didn't know what the end, you just you even talked about that, they didn't know what the end point was going to look like. They just had this commitment, this idea, this goal that, that was really powerful to them that they couldn't ignore. And by following that goal, despite their fears and despite their lack of confidence around it, they managed to create something amazing. And that's true with any, any that's part of the creative process, like you said, whether you're building a nonprofit or painting a painting or writing a book. You don't, you don't start knowing exactly what you're going to create and having everything you need right at the beginning. You, you develop what you need in the process of, of creating. I, I love the way you describe that as the call. Um, in, in Joseph Campbell's book, Hero with a Thousand Faces, he uh, talks about that. What is the call that we get? How do we, this is not being a hero, but each of us have that within us to be the hero. When we follow that call and respond, it's almost like in a, in a place of worship we have call and response. What is the call I have and what is my response? My mm. response is to act. My response is to act. And I think that's what you've just described is really a beautiful way of doing that. Because I think that this is something which feeds our spirit. 
It's something which feeds our desire to participate in community. Uh, they're, 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 our desire as human beings to be with one another, to collaborate, to cooperate, to give gifts to each other. That's who we are as a species. We're not a competitive, warring species. That's brought on by others who tell us we need to compete who tell us we need to war. The majority of the wars in the world have been designed by a handful of men, not by communities of people, by, by, hands fulls, by a handful of men who push us into this. So if we find our calling on a daily basis to do this work, we will find the creative ways to respond. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. This, is, this has been a really great talk, and I'm sure it's going to stick in my mind for a while. Um, oh, no, it's not over. <laughs> no, no, it's not, but we're, we're running short on time. And before we run out of time, uh, Stephen, I'd love to hear a little bit about what you're working on right now or what sort of interesting things you have coming up. The, the privilege of doing this work, and, and thank you again for inviting me to share some of this work with all of you. That's part of the movement, just sharing of knowledge. Who knows what we might connect with? One of your listeners may like it. You, I'm able to hear from, from you of something we may be able to do going forward. These are memes that we put out there. They're ideas that we put out there. So I, I have the privilege now of working with a group of students in a number of different ways. Um, we have a workshop going on in our urban ecology program here, which I've been helpful in getting started as a creative act. Um, we've changed our planning program to urban ecology. It's a way of thinking. It changes the way we think about cities, not as a series of objects but a series of systems that work together to uh, function as an ecology. And one of the problems that we've recognized here is that the creeks that run from our mountains, our beautiful mountains, um, have been put underground, many of them. Not all and not all the way. But what the students are working on is a 100-year plan to bring all of those seven creeks back up to the surface so they flow down into a river that's in our city and then into the Great Salt Lake. To think about a creative process that is going to be a hundred years in the making sort of picks up on the Greek proverb that um, men should plant trees under whose shade they will never sit. It's, it's, it has that forward thinking. It has sort of that seventh generation, as Native Americans would, would perhaps talk about. So this is a big project I'm working on with students. But another one that may be even more exciting for some of your listeners is one that we call Impact Images. And this has been put together by our honor scholars. And it's the idea of how do we make the invisible visible. The, making the invisible visible is something that, that artists do, right? They have an idea. It's invisible. It exists in their head. And then they use whatever tools to make it visible. One of the things that we've noticed in terms of energy consumption on our planet is that people's behavior, especially the United States, is such that they still believe that electricity comes from the wall. <laughs> right? And it doesn't. So what the students have come up with is a redesign of the switch plate, you know, the little switch plate that's on the wall that has the toggle switch. It actually has a two inch by two inch frame above it. And the idea is to place an image, what they call an impact image in there, that reminds people to remember that the electricity doesn't come from a wall. So one of these images, for example, is the face of a coal miner. Mm. And, you know, his face is very black from his day's work, and his eyes are weary from his day's work. And who knows what's going on in his body from the years and years of toiling under the ground to get that electricity to your wall. So it humanizes that. What's happened with this, and this is again the idea of how we connect and grow ideas, is that another professor here in our college has put together a program, a, a specific project for her, her, her sustainability, uh, sustain, sustainable design program. She's given the assignment that each student has come up with nine of these impact images, really as graphic designers to make an impact on how how they as graphic designers could respond to this. What I saw yesterday from the way the students began to understand, first of all, the electricity doesn't come from my wall, <laughs> and the kind of images. You know that piece by Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel that has the two hands of um, God and man coming together? They're you're coming to, to this point. Mm -hmm. One put it, put it together with the light switch in between. <laughs> so that becomes that spark. Just Photoshop it. 
Let yeah. there be light. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Many, yeah. exactly. And so what's happened is this is now generative. What more can we as creators want than for an idea to be generative? So those are two projects that I'm working on. Uh, and another one is the Urban Ecology Network that I'm putting together. We're doing a project with students that is having students uh, engage in creative acts in their neighborhood, act, acts which turn them into activists to change their neighborhood. So I've got a lot of things going on, and it's all born from that same idea that we create from what, what we lack, not from what we have. Mm. Yeah. Well, Stephen, again, thank you so much for being here. Uh, Minnie and Melissa and I certainly appreciate your time and certainly appreciate your words. It's yeah, a privilege to be with you. Thank you so much. And Melissa, I look forward to seeing your work online or wherever I can find it. And Corey, please stay in touch. Minnie, yeah. buy a cup of coffee one day. Get out here. Oh, well, sure. <laughs> I've always wanted to see you talk. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Creative Insurgents, Creative Insurgents. Subscribe at creativeinsurgents.com.